Lindsay, why don't you come? Are you cl close at hand? Lindsay, there you are. Today we're honoring graduates. Actually, we have a couple of graduates. Uh, Jack Waugh was homeschooled, and he graduated last year. And uh, kind of, it's been kind of a with COVID and all the crazy things that are going on. It's been a little bit. It's been a little bit crazy. Jack was not able to be here today, and so Lindsay is here. Lindsay graduated from Liberty Union just a just what about a week ago, and you'll be honored. I mean, honored whom honors you. Lindsay graduated with honors from. Liberty Union. Come on, church. That's not, not so easy, right? I always tell the kids that I spent like five of the best years of my life in fifth grade, you know, so to, to come through, to graduate, to, to be that, that way is really an amazing thing. So we're proud of you, Lindsay. She's been here since she's been just a wee little snap. Many of you have watched her grow up. We, we love her. She's getting ready to go to Central Ohio Technical College. Well, you're actually going there her senior year in college, she kind of already did her freshman year in college. Her senior year in high school, she already did her freshman year in college. So it's like she's way ahead of the game. But she's going to be, pardon? Yeah, that is kind of nice, yeah? So you're going to be studying sonology, sonography. sonography. And so she's going to be learning how to take pictures and all those kind of things. And, and, and so we are, we're, we're just grateful for all that's going to happen and all that that's going to be. So we, we have... We have, as a church family, gotten a gift for you. It's, it's, a, it's a study Bible. It's ESV. It's even got your name here. So your mom or your dad or your sisters will not be able to steal it from you, right? We, we want you to have this. You're entering into a time that's a little bit crazy and where your faith has been challenged. It's going to be challenged even more. And David said so clearly that, that God's word was a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. And if you'll keep your eyes focused, not only will you be to grow to be the woman that he wants you to be, you'll grow to make a difference in this world as he wants you to make. That's what we're talking about today in Acts chapter 19. So congratulations. We're, we're blessed by you. Can I pray for you? Can we do that? So Father, thank you so much for Lindsay. Thank you for the Smith family. Father, we know that, that Lindsay has been blessed with a father and a mother who love you, who honor you, who cherish you. Father, we know that she has seen firsthand, up close and personal, a life of faith through her parents. Father, we know that she's witnessed that. She's been encouraged by that. And Father, now as she's taking this huge step of transition in her life, we just pray your blessing upon her. Father, I pray that you will ever be close to her. As she's in school, I pray that, that the words that come from your word and from your truth will resonate in her heart, resonate in her mind, and the Father, she will stand firm to, to stay true to the things that you have called her to, to know and the light that you have called her to pass on. So, Father, in, in school and in her future career and, Father, in her future relationships and marriage and family and kids that are coming her way, we just pray that you will lead her and guide her and move her and help her to be everything that you have called her to be. And, Father, I pray that the life that is moving ahead, straight ahead in Lindsay, would be a life that would bring you joy and it would bring you great encouragement as you look down upon your servant. So Father, we're grateful for her, grateful for this uh, perseverance to this point, grateful for the honor that she has received in standing tall and standing firm and uh, grateful for her, for her, for the honors that have come her way as an honor graduate. And now, Father, just pray that you'll continue to move, continue to use her as she walks your ways. And we lift it in the name of a Jesus who makes it possible. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a time. Well, we are moving in the book of Acts to chapter 19. Chapter 19 is where it kind of all begins for the Ephesus church. Paul was moving there as he is moving into his third missionary journey. Now, one, one of the verses of the New Testament that has always had my attention is from the Apostle Paul. It's written in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. And here's what Paul says. How can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, 
How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, Paul was quoting here from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, from Nahum, and maybe you don't even realize that reading these, but Paul is drawing on his Old Testament skill here to bring... (coughs) Thank you for that. I've been having this cold for three months, and it's been hitting me and hitting me. And about three weeks ago, I thought I was finally safe from it and done. And about three days ago, I was going, huh, huh. And now here it is again. So I'm probably going to do that more than once. So you'll forgive me in advance, right? Anyway, Paul is, uh, Paul is now quoting from his reservoir of the Old Testament, talking about evangelists. And if there's anybody who had beautiful feet, it was the Apostle Paul. It's been estimated that the Apostle Paul traveled 11 thousand miles during his ministry years and in today's world of jet setting that might not seem like much you know you get on a plane you fly literally across the country from new york to california in five or six hours we may say eleven thousand miles what's the big deal well what you need to know is that the vast majority of miles that paul was 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 traveling were by foot If there's ever been anybody who has given his feet more to the cause of the kingdom of god I don't know anybody that would be ahead of the Apostle Paul. This morning we're in Acts chapter 19. And back in chapter 18, verse 23, Paul had taken a short rest. He had come from Corinth after the ministry there. We talked last week. had sped his way home, gone to Jerusalem, and then up to Antioch at the end of his second journey to report and have a little bit of time off. And then suddenly Paul was off again. He He began his third journey like he began his second journey. That was taking the overland route away from Antioch of Syria and moving moving kind of north and west. He was getting into the regions of Galatia and Phrygia where he had founded four churches at least that we know about, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium, and Antioch. He was there to encourage the the brothers and sisters. And then after he was there, he went on to Ephesus walking to Ephesus. And that's where we're picking up this morning in Acts chapter 19. So let's dig in. And as we begin, I, what I really want to do is put in front of you the, the, the city, which, which in that world, in that time, would have been the great metropolis of Asia Minor. If you know anything about the New Testament, you've heard about the city of Ephesus. The church in Ephesus is one of the most well-known in the New Testament. But, but, but Ephesus was so much more than a city that just had a church in it. Ephesus was one of the leading cities of the ancient Near East. And to give it location in your mind, you just need to look at a map. Jerusalem would be down here at the bottom on the right, going up straight north to Antioch. Paul then traveled across to to Derbe, Iconium, Antioch, and and then from there kind of straight east into Ephesus. Ephesus was located on the Aegean Sea, the west coast of the Aegean Sea. And that would be today modern Turkey. It was situated on the Kester River. And literally it sat upstream about three miles from from the coast where the Kester River literally emptied or dumped into the Aegean Sea. It also sat on two important Roman roads. The coastal road, which was going straight north up towards Smyrna and then Pergamum. And then the western route that went through Colossae, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and the regions of Phrygia and beyond. If the names of some of those cities sound familiar, they should, because several of them that this, these Roman roads went through were, were cities that we learn about in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the cities of Asia Minor, the churches, that, the seven churches of Revelation that Jesus spoke to, in, including Revelation. The city was important for several reasons. First of all, It was important economically. Its seaport was unparalleled in Asia Minor. The seaport that fed the city was the most important seaport in Asia Minor. Ephesus was, because of that, Ephesus was connected to to Egypt, to Africa, Palestine, Rome, Greece, all from this port. Goods from literally around the world flowed to Ephesus and also transported out. Import, export. In addition, the Roman roads that made their way to the city of Ephesus brought additional trade and tourism to the city. 
In, power, in, in addition to the powerful economics of the city was its size. It was the largest city in the region. Pergamum, which sat north about 100 miles, was the capital of Asia Minor. But Ephesus boasted a significantly larger population, at least by 100,000. And some people have estimated that the, that the, the population of, of Ephesus was about a half a million. That compares to the city of Rome itself, which in this day was, was the population of about one million. Now, added to its size and economic status, Eph- Ephesus was also cultural like capital. It offered everything that you would want, and it would put it literally right at your fingertips. The population size and the wealth of the city would, would enable that to happen. The city was able to provide people with just about anything that they could dream of. Now, of note would have been the massive amphitheater that, 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 that sat in the city. It had a capacity of 25,000 people. I mean, these are the ruins of that place that are still standing today. And, and, and events from Acts chapter 19 happened in this very place. It provided a platform for theater groups and teachers and, and, and others that would maybe come there to bring entertainment or to bring teaching and training. Now, uh, on top of that, the city also boasted a remarkable library. This, this, this library provided a platform for, uh, for all kinds of reading and all kinds of study. The Celsus Library was, was, was only next to the Alexandria Library as far as size and scope. And about two-thirds of a kilometer from the amphitheater was a great stadium. It, it, it served as a spot for for city and regional athletic events. The events here would have been wide and varied. Track and field on the eastern part of this, many believe that gladiators kind of had it out there. And also in that place, people would have wrestling matches, Greco-Roman wrestling matches. And if that wasn't enough, sometimes they would bring in wild beasts. So it'd be man on man or man on beast. But the thing that kind of stood out above all is the road called the Arcadia Way. It stretched literally for three miles in length, from the seaport to the amphitheater. And the street was paved with marble stone. The street was flanked on each side by rows of columns that ran sometimes up to 50 feet deep. And then behind these columns were all kinds of of buildings and gathering places, baths, gymnasiums, the great fountain of Trajan, the Odegion, or the little theater, which served as the council chambers for the city's government. The Celsus Library, you can kind of see in a big picture, kind of off in the distance there. There's also the Agora, which was the marketplace. That would be the place that you would come and and gather, you know, buy groceries and and kind of buy, sell, trade. In addition, there were several houses of prostitution that were along this road. Remember, it was a port city being, uh, being populated by sailors that were coming to town looking for a good time. The Arcadia was a place that you could go and spend a month or two. There was always something happening, always something to see, always something new to grab your attention and potentially your wallet. Ephesus was a city that had it all. The geographer Strabo, a contemporary of Jesus and the Apostle Paul, said about the city that it was the market of Asia. But probably the thing that made the city most noteworthy was religion. And that would have been the worship of Artemis, who was also known as Diana. Ephesus had temples and shrines to a host of Greek and Roman gods, but the temple that stood out, the temple that made the Ephesians literally swell up with pride, and also served as their number one tourist attraction, was the temple of Artemis. People were literally coming from around the world to worship here and to see this place. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. You can see some of the ruins up there on the left. On the bottom right would be an artist's conception of what it might have looked like. It was literally one and a half city blocks long. It was supported by 127 columns that were nearly 200 feet tall, if that will give you some perspective. And to help you understand how big that is, from that wall to this wall is about 105 feet. So if you took this building and stood it on its side and then doubled the size of that, that's how big these columns were. 
It was studded, studded with golds and jewels. And as many of you know, it was dubbed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Greek goddess, goddess Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo, and they were both children, offspring of Zeus. Artemis was known as the moon goddess, the goddess of hunting, and the patroness of young girls. The temple at Ephesus housed the multi-breasted image of Artemis, and that, that image was believed to be uh, uh, an image that was thrown from the heavens by Zeus himself and landed on the earth. Worship of Artemis was unspeakably vile. The temple was attended by numerous priests, eunuchs, and slaves. And in addition to that, there were thousands of priestesses. And you remember from our talk about Corinth last week and their temple up in that, up in that, uh, that great 1,500-foot with stone mountain, uh, these priestesses were simply glorified prostitutes. The worship of Artemis was one huge orgy, if you can believe that. Every vile act imaginable was committed here. But the temple was more than a simple place of worship. It also served as the bank of the Mediterranean. People from all over the world literally brought their valuables and they put them on deposit in, in, in this temple. I guess they figured that nobody would steal from a goddess, especially if she was the, the daughter of Zeus. On top of that, it was a criminal asylum. If the law was after you, I mean, like if you had done something wrong and you were being pursued, you could run to Ephesus and you could put your hands onto the temple of Artemis and you could, you could cry out, free. Sort of like the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. Because of that, Ephesus was a home base for criminals. They came from the, around the world, and there were so many of them that at first, the temple grounds were called this free zone. You had to stay there. You couldn't, you couldn't move outside of that. But it came to be so many criminals that were living in Ephesus that the entire city became the home base. That if you were in Ephesus and you were a criminal and you had called free, then the law had to leave you alone. Sounds like a place you would want to take your kids on vacation or a place you would want to raise your kids, right? The temple also served as a base of big business. As you would imagine, they sold all kinds of statues of Artemis, trinkets. Believers who came to worship would, would want to take one of these home with them. They were selling thousands upon thousands upon thousands thousands of them. In fact, this business venture is one of the things that got the Apostle Paul in hot water. We'll talk about that in a minute. The city of Ephesus was supported by all the things listed above, and it was a chaotic cacophony of immorality. It was dark. The city, in, in spite of its wealth and in spite of its, its temples, was dark, far from God. And that leads to the next thought, Paul's heart. Paul's heart. He was drawn, drawn to the city. He was drawn to the region. Ephesus, being far from God, drew the Apostle Paul's attention. He wanted nothing more than to go to that city and proclaim the truth. Why? Well, I mean, why, why not avoid a pagan place like this? Why not find something that would be maybe a little bit more receptive? And the answer is really simple. Light shines best in very dark places. The apostle's heart would have been pounding to go there and make a difference, to lead the darkness to the light. As we study through the book of Acts, we can see the heart of Paul for, for Ephesus at work. In fact, it began in chapter 16, because in chapter 16 was the first time he attempted to move into the region, and this was the beginning of his second missionary journey. In Acts 15, the decision was made that he was going to go. He brought Silas with him. They kind of went through that interior road. They went to Derby and Lystra and, and Iconium and Antioch, and they were encouraging those churches. And you can read all about that in Acts 13 and 14. But ever the evangelist, Paul was looking to move to the next region. And Asia, Asia Minor, would have been that next region that, that didn't have the Lord. And so it was, it was the next region. It made sense that this would be the place that Paul would go. But then we read the, these words in Acts 16, 6. 
that they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, we're never given an understanding of what this word was or how Paul knew that he needed to stay away from it, but, but, but he was trying to go at, on his second journey, and he couldn't. God, through a vision, led him to Macedonia, a man crying out, come help us. Paul went, and because of that, we, we, have, we have Christians and churches that were founded in, in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, and then, and then further on down into Athens and Corinth. But that doesn't mean that Paul lost sight of Asia Minor. When God said, don't go there now, when he was forbidding, that didn't mean he was forbidden later. And that leads to letter B. At the end of that same journey, that same second missionary journey, he made a stop on his way home in Ephesus. And Paul's ministry in Corinth came to an end. He got on a boat. He crossed the Aegean Sea. And then he went to Ephesus, just for a quick stop. You can read about the, that short introduction to the city in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 21. He went to the local synagogue. He reasoned with the Jews about Jesus. The Jews in the synagogue were intrigued. In fact, so intrigued that they were asking Paul to stay. But Paul needed to go home. And as he, as he was leaving, he had this to say, Acts 18, 21. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return it to you if God wills. And then he set sail from Ephesus. That took him to Caesarea, into Jerusalem, and then, and then finally back home to Antioch. And that leads to Acts chapter 19, Paul's third missionary journey. His focus on the third journey, in my mind, was obviously Ephesus. Third journey began much like the second journey. He took the overland route. He left he left Antioch, he moved up, he went to Lystra, Derby, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And, and then when he, was, when he was done moving through there, um, after he had preached the word there and, and encouraged the, the Christians and the churches, then we read this in Acts chapter 19.1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, and, and Apollos had come to Ephesus, he had been there, and then he's now gone to Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country, he walked, and he came to Ephesus. And it just makes me believe that Paul had been looking in this direction for a very long time. This major city, the most important city in Asia Minor, was nose deep in depravity, and they, being as far from God as anybody anywhere on the face of the earth. The city of Ephesus also provided Paul with that kind of hub evangelistic strategy that we talked about. Go to the major city, and, and from there we'll have an impact on the surrounding regions. It happened because while he was here, all these other churches of Asia Minor were probably started. So Paul had his heart pointed to the city for years, years. And now upon his arrival, Luke takes us, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, takes 20 verses to talk about the ministry that took place there. And, and here's what we learn. His ministry... The word of the Lord spread widely, and it grew in power. In this dark place, people were coming to Christ. Paul's ministry in Ephesus lasted two and a half, some people say about three years. And the ministry started about the minute he stepped into the city. The first guys he comes in contact with are 12 disciples of John. And when I say John, you may want to write in your notes here, John the Baptist. The first people that he came in contact with were disciples, Acts chapter 19, 7. Now, th th this, this word disciple may make you think that these were Christians because we talk about the followers of Jesus being Christians. But that's not, the word disciple simply means follower, following something or someone. Many of you are Ohio State Buckeye disciples. You know what I mean? You follow them. Whatever, whatever it is that's got your attention or your mind, you, you could say that I'm following that. That the Disciple doesn't get set apart for a Christian. But the text doesn't say that, that, that they were following Christ at all. So Paul asked them the pertinent question. In Acts chapter 19, too, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why was this the pertinent question? Because all believers in Jesus have the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ and you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. So he's asking, he's asking, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their answer was, no. No, we have not, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. 
What, what in the world are you talking about? The answer proved that they were not followers of Jesus. So the next question from Paul was equally important. He said to them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. John the Baptist's baptism. Now again, you, you may be confused here. I want to encourage you to not be. I mean, you, you knew, you know, don't you, that the Jews baptized. It was called a mikvah. It's a baptism of repentance. It's a ceremonial washing. It's a dunking, a washing that takes place over and over and over in the life of the Jew so, so he can be ceremonially clean to participate in Judaism. But, but, the, but the deal is you were never, ever, ever, ever really truly clean. And so all of this was just a reminder of how unclean you really were, which was the point that God was trying to make to drive you to the one who could make you clean. It's the baptism that John was preaching to the Jews when he was the forerunner to Jesus and he was out in the Jordan River baptizing and he was telling people to repent, turn to God. The kingdom of God is near. Get cleaned up for that purpose. The the day the church started, the baptism that Peter preached took on a whole new meaning. Baptism into Christ signified a once and for all cleansing from your sin. It wasn't something you had to do over and over and over ad nauseum again. No, in Christ you are clean. In Christ your sins are washed away. In Christ they are thrown away. In Christ they are remembered no more. Come on, church, we have reason to celebrate, right? Yes? Acts 2.38, Peter was being, was being quizzed. What should we do? And this crowd on the day of Pentecost, Peter simply said to them, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because you are clean through Jesus, your body can now be a temple of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So you receive him at your baptism as well. Forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. That these men had received John's baptism means their baptism was a mikvah. With the, with the distinction made, Paul led them to Jesus. They were baptized. Baptized in the name of Jesus. But like Peter said in Acts 2.38, for the, for the remission of sins and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul did this, then we, we read these interesting words in Acts chapter 19.6. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, some people read this and have a hard time with this laying on of hands and receiving the Holy Spirit. And then people speaking in tongues. People use this passage in a way that it was never intended to be used. They they call this like a normative process in in, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you're baptized and then somebody comes and lays hands on you and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues. Every time in the New Testament we see a new group coming to Christ, this is what we see happening. And the reason is because the Jews thought that they were the only ones that were going to be ushered into the kingdom. So so suddenly that's not happening because in Acts chapter chapter 2 we see the Jews coming, the day of Pentecost. And then in Acts chapter 8 we see the Samaritans coming in, the half-Jews. And the apostles would then show up, they would lay hands, and the Holy Spirit would come. Then in Acts chapter 10, we see, we see the house of Cornelius, Gentiles coming to Christ. And so Peter was there, laying on of hands, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now, here we are in Acts chapter 19, where we have these disciples of John the Baptist. The same thing is happening. In each instance, the same set of events took place. Baptism, laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. The purpose of that was to show the world and to show all the believers that God intended what happened to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, happened to the Samaritans, happened to the disciple, it happened to, it, it happened to the Gentiles, and now it's happening to the disciples of John. It's gone across the board. Everybody, because this was God's will, that everybody would be saved. And so every group was ushered in. But this was not the normative practice. This was just a highlight for God to say, this has got my stamp of approval. It's exactly what I want to see happen. After the groups were ushered in, and the simple reading of Acts 2.38 took place, how do I get saved? I believe, confess, repent, and then I'm baptized. 
And when I'm baptized, I'm the, God's forgiving my sins. They're being washed away. I'm receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nothing else needs to be done. The point here is that the last group of people have now come to Christ. These disciples of John are now disciples of Jesus. And with that work completed, then Paul moved on, letter B, to the synagogue. And as he had promised to the group of Jewish followers of the Old Testament, during his brief stop back in chapter 18, when he said, if it's God's will, I'll be back. But now here he is. He's keeping his promise. His ministry in the synagogue of Ephesus went much like what took place in other synagogues in other cities. Verse 8 says, he entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Paul took the Old Testament and laid out a logical, reasoned argument that, number one, Jesus is the Messiah, that he came to die for our sins, he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and he is coming back. The way that you get to heaven is only through him. Accept him and follow him. Become his disciple. Text, the text says he stayed for three months, every Sabbath, entering in to this hallowed ground and teaching these people, encouraging them to come to Christ. He did it boldly. And as was most often the case, not everybody was thrilled with the message. Acts 19.9 goes on to say, when some became stubborn, some of the Jews in the synagogue, and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, before the way being of, of the way of Jesus, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. Now, here's the deal. When you can't win the argument, you just scream. When you can't win the argument, you just get angry and you get abusive. It's, it's obvious at this point that all the people in the synagogue that are going to come to Christ have done it because now it's just turning to abuse. But the three months wasn't without fail because there were followers of Jesus in that place. So now that the abuse is starting and all these people are saying, we've had it, we don't want to hear anymore, la, 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 Paul said, that's fine. He got up and he grabbed those followers, the new believers, and he took them with him. He left, but he didn't stop preaching. Paul did what he always did. When he left the synagogue, he would go to some place in the city and he would take the next step. And the next place that he went was the lecture hall of Tranus. Now, your, your, your text says the hall of Tranus. What you need to understand is this is like a classroom. Tranus was like a professor. In Acts 19, 9 says he withdrew the disciples, re, and, he, and he went reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Tyrannus was like a professor in a college, and he had this large lecture hall. And so Tyrannus was using the classroom in the morning and and there's some manuscripts that talk about this that are not in your New Testament that talk about then in the afternoon, Paul would take over this lecture hall and people would be coming in and he would be then lecturing about Jesus. His success in the classroom was of such that two remarkable things happened. Number one, Paul's lectures went on for two years. That's, I mean, Acts 19.10 lays it out. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine having the great, privilege and blessing of going to the school, sitting down, and for four or five hours a day, hearing the Apostle Paul teach, to hear the scholar unload about the Old Testament and how it's all fulfilled in Jesus and leading people to that place. The second result of this two-year lecture series was that the gospel literally spread throughout all of Asia Minor. That's, that's literally where the verse takes us to. And this is where I want you to focus in on. This was that hub ministry model being seen at its finest. And, and, and at the same time, the gospel was going, it was going out to all of the people, groups that were represented in the, in the apostolic appointing, you know, of that laying on of hands. Because this is what's going on. All people are coming to Christ. It's always been God's desire. And that leads to a rather interesting passage that, that probably needs a few moments to, to, to think about. Acts 19 11 says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. If you've watched any of the modern-day faith healers, 
You've probably seen some of this stuff going on. You've probably heard it, you know, the commercials that are going on. I've been to the Jordan. I had a whole pile of handkerchiefs. I dipped them all into the Jordan River. I, I laid them all out. I prayed over them. And now if you just send me some money, $100, $1,000, you know, God's going to, you know, sow a seed, sow a seed. I'll send you this handkerchief. It's going to be, it's going to be. Some of that thinking has come from this passage right here. As I said a few minutes ago, some of what was happening in the book of Acts was not normative. It was transitional. And that, that's what's going on here. God was bringing powerful miracles upon the church through the apostles, through Jesus. He brought these miracles to give credence and make this loud proclamation that what you are hearing is true. It is from God. The miracles gave a purpose. And that was to show that this actually was the word of God. So follow it. And what's going on today is crazy because we really don't need any of that. At this point, we have God's word. And, and, and friends, this is known to be the word of God. Amen, church? Yes? And God's word, which has been delivered to us, has come with power and authority through the hands of the apostles. And so what we have right here is the truth. And what God is calling us to do is quit seeking the experience. Quit seeking, you know, oh, my heart just feels, oh, my heart feels, I just need another miracle. I just need another miracle. No, you don't. What you need simply is to be amazed that God gave us everything that we need to know the truth and to follow him. Here's the truth. The Bible's enough. And here's the other truth. Jesus is enough. Come on, church. Amen. Yes? It's enough. So the word of God was spreading. In this dark city, some miracles were being accomplished because God was giving credence to this to draw the Ephesians' attention. And the word of God spread with power. The message was being delivered to everybody in Asia Minor and people in these other cities, Laodicea, Philadelphia, Smyrna. They were coming to Christ and churches were being formed. And wouldn't you know, Satan decided to try and mess it all up. That's where we turn next. Paul was involved in exposing some false prophets. Just like Satan to show up and start trying to mimic actions that were having positive effects. So the next thing we read is this, Acts 19, 13. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now it's interesting the, the words that, that Luke is using here, the first one is Jewish. The men were claiming to have Jewish roots, but what I'm telling you is that's, that's really, as you're reading this text, questionable. Because the bottom line is that they were not doing the work of God. So whoever they claimed to be, being associated with the God of the Old Testament, was not who they were. The second thing that Luke says about these guys is that they were itinerant. That means traveling, you know, like wandering or roaming or nomadic. The picture that comes to my mind here is like a circus troupe, you know, that is over here, it sets up in a town, it does its week-long thing, and then it tears down and then it moves 100, 150 miles down the road to another town where it sets up. And, and, and what these guys were were nothing but con men. They were opportunists. They were looking to make a buck by taking advantage of the situation. And, and when they got to Ephesus and suddenly Paul's here and they're seeing what's going on, they're thinking, this, this, this is our ticket to a lot of money in Ephesus. And so they, so, they, so they started moving out. Now the leader of this group was a man named Sceva. Verse 14 tells us that he was a Jewish high priest. But what you have to know is in the annals of history and all that's been written about Judaism from the first century, there's not, there's not one remark about a high priest named Sceva. What that means is he was a fraud. Sceva had seven sons. And they showed up in Ephesus, and they saw what Paul was doing, and then they proclaimed to have, be able to do the exact same thing. You know, we can exercise the demons out of you. In fact, if you give us a few bucks, we'll do it for you. And listen to the words they use. Verse 13, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They had no relationship with Jesus. They really didn't know what in the world they were saying. 
they, they just saw Paul do this, and so they're saying, in that name, with that authority, we're, 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 we're doing the same thing. And that's when the comical part of the story takes place. At one point, they were actually take, talking to a man who was actually demon-possessed. And while the sons of Sceva were adjuring the demon to leave in the name of Paul, suddenly the demon is speaking back. The demon says in verse 15, he said, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who in the world are you? I have no idea who you are. And with that, the demon-possessed man jumps, literally leaps upon these seven sons of Sceva. And what goes on is he's like, he's like supernaturally strong with the power of this demon, and he overtakes these seven men, and he knocks them down. And if you're reading the text here, he beats them up. I mean, he, he messes them up. And then what he does is he rips all their clothes off. So now these guys are running down the street naked because they've been stripped of their clothes and really, you know, of any kind of pride or honor by this demon. And the whole event became known to the people of Ephesus. And what you have to know here is this, fear gripped the town. The spiritual world they had believed existed. I mean, after all, they got the Temple of Artemis here. They now know the spiritual world exists. And it brought about a whole new level of repentance to the city. Because see, at this point, a whole lot of people are synced with them. What that means is they're, you know, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of Artemis, you know, a little bit of Zeus, a little, you know, a little bit of, you know, making some money. And, you know, my religion is kind of all of this. I take little pieces, and Jesus never calls for that. Jesus calls us to sell out to him. And now these people in the city who have books on the occult and, you know, they have their charms, they have all this other stuff, are saying, we can't mess with this anymore. And so what they did is they... They literally had a book burning. These people are now bringing all these books and this occultic stuff, and they're throwing it on the fire, and they are repenting, and they are turning to Jesus. And verse 20 makes this declaration. The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. My friends, I'm just telling you, this is the power of God. He's constantly working to draw people to himself, and he will use every circumstance to enable it to happen. By now, Paul had been in the city of Ephesus for two years and three months, at least, three months in the, in the synagogue, two years at the, at the lecture hall of Tyrannus, and it, it, it could be longer than that. And with that, the goal of reaching the region being accomplished, because we learned that in verse 10, Paul was once again focusing out. He had done what he intended to do in Ephesus. And that brings us to the fourth point. Paul's now making a declaration. And that's, his, that's dealing with his future plans. Paul just lays them out. We come to this point in the life of Paul. He's probably around 60 years of age. It's a time for a lot of people that they're considering retirement, considering what they're going to do, how they're going to slow down. You know, I'm going to get a hobby. I'm going to play a little golf. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to read some books. I'm going to get into some gardening. I'm maybe going to sleep a little bit more. Not Paul. Paul's ministry in Ephesus is winding down the city that he's been looking to forward to for so long to be, and it's winding down. Paul is now looking out about what he's planning to do next. And here's what he says, Acts 19.21. After these events, Paul resolved in his spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, again, following the journey from to going up to Philippi and Berea and Thessalonica, and then, and then following down the coast to Athens and to Corinth. He's going to go into Macedonia and then down into Achaia. And then he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And after I have been there, I'm going to Rome. Paul's plan was to retrace these steps and then get home, report, and go to Rome. In fact, Paul got to Corinth on this third missionary journey several months later. And we learned from that point that he literally wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome, people that he had never met. We have that in our Bible. It's called the Book of Romans. And at this, this, at this strategic moment, Ephesus erupted into a riot. Point five. Suddenly the city is in an uproar. You can read all about it in Acts 19, 23 through 41. And I'm not going to say a lot here. I would encourage you to go home and read this passage. But again, this is, this is the enemy just doing all he can do to throw wrench into the plans. You notice 
put a stick into the spokes and try to bring the whole thing to a halt. But I do, want, I do want to make sure that a couple of points are made to you. The first is this. The, the enemy never ceases stirring up opposition to God's kingdom. Never. I want to encourage you, again, to go home and read these ending verses. The bottom line is that Paul's preaching and drawing people to Jesus had really put a dent into the business of the artisans of Ephesus. All of these people that were using their artistic skills and they were making idols, you know, statues of Artemis and of the temple and trinkets and things to take home. Suddenly that lucrative market is starting to dry up because people all across Asia Minor have heard the message of Jesus and, and, and thousands of people are turning to following Jesus. And because of that, the artisans came together under the leadership of a man named Demetrius. They ratcheted the city into an uproar. How dare these people mess with our goddess and our livelihood? And then they drug Gaius and Aristarchus, two of Paul's traveling companions on this third missionary journey. They drug them into that huge amphitheater. And the reason I think they drug them into that is because the place was probably filled with 25,000 people who were screaming. In fact, the screaming goes on for two hours. Great is Artemis. Great is Artemis. Great is Artemis. And you could just see bad things getting ready to happen. Now, Paul wanted to go down, and he wanted to speak to the crowd. But the other followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, told him, absolutely no way. We're not letting you go in there because you are exactly what they want. They will rip you limb from limb. So they forbade Paul to go in. Eventually, the city clerk of Ephesus stood up. He brought the people to a quiet, and he pleaded with them. He says, we are in danger of being reported to Rome for rioting. And that's not a good thing because the Roman soldiers will come in here and they will shut us down. We need to calm down. And here's what the city clerk said. If these men have done something wrong, which I don't think they have, I don't think they've stolen anything, I don't think they've blasphemed anybody, but if they've done something wrong, then Demetrius and all the other artisans, what they need to do is file suit and take it to court. Let the court system do its job. For now, please, everybody, go home. Now, the plea works mob did settle down, and they did go home. And Acts chapter 20, verse 1, tells us that Paul met with the believers, and after he had encouraged them, then he set out to fulfill that declaration. I'm going to Macedonia, and then I'm going down to Achaia, I'm going to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to Rome. And when it comes to our Christian life, friends, there are several things. We all need to commit to doing. And as I look at this passage of Scripture, four thoughts pop into my mind. And there's, they're, they're nothing new here. They're things that we've been talking about. I want to lay them in front of you again. Things that we can learn from the Apostle Paul. And the first one is that we need to live daily as, a, as an ambassador for God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's going to pin these words that, that we have been given the mantle to be his ambassadors on this earth. It is the reason that we are still here. The reason that God didn't take us to heaven, the, the minute we, that, we, that we were saved, the minute that we received Jesus, the minute that we were baptized, the minute that we, our sins were forgiven, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the reason God didn't take us immediately to heaven at that moment is because he was leaving us here to make a difference, to be his ambassador. Because this is Paul. I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm not retiring. I'm going to be doing this work until the day I die. And that's what we need to do. We need to commit to that task. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am an ambassador for Christ. Would you say that with me? I am an ambassador for Christ. Come on, say it again. I am for Christ. And then take the second step, and that's to always be ready to speak out for the sake of God's kingdom as his ambassador. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready. Always be ready because the, to, to give an answer for all that truth and hope that you have. When people come to you and say, why are you the way that you are? Ambassadors, when given the opportunity, speak. And we do it in, in love and in grace, but we speak always. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons we're reading God's Word, to take it in, to learn it, to memorize it. 
So that when those moments come, the Holy Spirit has something to draw on to bring from our heads into our mouths to give to other people. And when that door of opportunity arises, which if we are committed to be these ambassadors, I'm telling you that God will use you. He, he will use you. So when those opportunities, when the doors open up, step through. Step in faith. Be obedient. Just like Paul. Didn't matter where he was. Didn't matter what he was doing. Given the opportunity, he stepped right in. And he obediently proclaimed the truth. And then the third idea here that just, again, pops up because it's, it's happened in Ephesus like it has every place else. And that is when, when we are living as an ambassador who's speaking the truth, we can expect to be troubled by the enemy. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, why are you surprised by all the fiery darts that are coming your way as, 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 as if something strange were happening to you? When, when persecution comes our way because we have chosen to be an ambassador and chosen to step through those open doors of opportunity and speak the truth and the grace and the love of God, you have to know that the enemy is not going to be happy about that. He is, he's going to come after you. But here's the incredible thing. Th those hardships are nothing more than a statement that actually you're in the exact right place that you need to be. And even more than that, when those hardships come, what, what's happening is you're just connecting more and more and more to the person of Jesus. Because if Jesus was persecuted and you were suffering that, it just brings you even closer to one last thing I want you to know, and that's that you need to believe with all of your heart, know, be certain that your Heavenly Father is blessed by your perseverance for Him. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that he's being, he's being poured out as a grain offering. When we get to 2 Timothy 4, it's probably, it's probably 12 years from where we are right now in the book of Acts. Paul's going to get arrested. He's going to spend four years in jail. He's going to be released. And, and at that point, many people believe that he went all the way to Spain to preach the gospel. And then he's rearrested. And under Nero's leadership, he has been, he's been martyred. He's killed. At that point, Paul's writing 2 Timothy 4. And he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. And here's what he said. I know, I know, I know that what awaits for me is the crown of righteousness. It, it's coming. God's going to give it to me. Not just to me, but all those who have loved, who have longed for his appearing. It's coming to me soon, and I want you to long for that same thing. Here's the truth, friends. When you live your life for God, that day is coming when you will stand before him, and he will tell you how pleased he is. And won't that be a great day when God looks at you and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul was a powerful ambassador for the Lord because he accepted these truths. And to them he added one more, Romans chapter 116, not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God and the salvation of everybody who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, because God wants all people saved, and I am happy to be his ambassador, to be his mouthpiece, and to go. Bow your head. Would you do that? And friends, as we come to this point in Paul's life and his mission journeys, the encouragement is to step out in faith. God's calling you to step up. And the question is, will you? It's the call, the clarion call. God wants to save you for a purpose. And now's an opportunity to say, Lord, I am yours. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be people who are firmly rooted in your will and in your way. And, that, Father, we would be living our daily lives to be exactly who you've called us to be and do exactly what you've called us to do. And, Father, from this place to Baltimore and beyond, it's our prayer that you would find us
Lord to stop us. Thank you. So this morning, there's a guy that lives about 50 miles north of here that is waking up to the full ire of NBC. He made national attention, not because he was a murderer, a car thief, selling drugs, beating his children, or anything along those lines. He made the dastardly claim in public that biblical marriage is the healthy way to go. That's it. In front of a group of people at a, at a graduation ceremony over just over a week ago, he talked about how the these now young adults should prepare their lives in a healthy manner and submit to the word. It's hard to believe that, that our media is so wound up over such a simple declaration. Do you think that Paul felt the same way? He goes into this town, or this city, full of wickedness and all kinds of sin, and all he did was tell the truth. Man, were they upset. So how did he deal with it? Well, in reality, we don't know. Acts doesn't tell us specifically what Paul did, other than continue on one step in front of the other, one message in front of the next. But we can look to Jesus. And what did he do? Well, the night, that, the night before he was betrayed, he was struggling. People were really upset with him. And so he withdrew to pray. And he didn't like what he was about to do. He got right, right down on his knees and begged God, if it is your will, take this cup from me. He didn't want to climb to Calvary. He didn't want to have his body broken. He didn't want to shed his blood. Who would? But at the end of the day, Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and said, if it is your will, it will be done. Are we ready to take the same steps? Are we ready to face those adversities? Are we ready to proclaim the name of Christ and stand on the word of truth, no matter what comes with it? As we come to this communion table today, I'd encourage you to, to meditate on those thoughts. Because the time is coming when standing for truth is going to be very painful. And so what do we need to do to prepare? How do we set our lives so that they align with God's will and follow after Jesus? Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come to your table. Lord, we know that we don't truly deserve to be here with you, that we were sinners, that we were your enemies, and that you came anyway that we are saved by your grace, that you have given your body and your blood so that we can be redeemed and restored. But with that comes a price that you have work for us to do. And so, Lord, as we partake of these emblems this morning, work on our hearts. Help to prepare us for the hardship that will follow. Help us to understand how we can speak your truth and when to speak your truth and to not be afraid of the enemy's attacks. Help to strengthen us and prepare us for all these things. And we lift it up to you in Jesus' name. we get ready to go today, just a couple of quick announcements. Number one, students, junior, senior hires will be here in this room tonight from 6 to 8 o'clock. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, there's a work day that is coming two weeks from yesterday. It's going to be happening on June 18th. And so um, there's a table on the back where you can sign up. Brad and Sherry are out of town this weekend, but there's a table there. You get your name on that list. We're still collecting funds for Sharice, the Sharista family in Nepal, helping them finish this house. And we're about a third of the way there. 
and some of my family and friends are going to be contributing to that too. But that's where we are at this point, about a third of the way, and so that, that, that's, that's really good. We've sent a bunch of rupees to Neera. She says, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, Bill Thomas wanted me to make sure that you know today that the, the blood drive is scheduled to happen a week from tomorrow, and that will be on June 13th. It's going from noon to 6 p.m., but for some reason, the, the sign-ups this year have been a little, this week for this blood drive have been a little bit slow, so we need to hurry get that up because if we don't pick those up then they'll 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 just cancel and we don't want to do that so see bill he's in the back he will help you know exactly how to sign up and uh, he can't do that here but you can do that online so let's get that done also summer wednesdays are in gear we started last week with kind of just a fun fellowship food night and we met in here it was a it was a good time with with the people that were here to this coming wednesday this this wednesday the eighth three days away we're going, to be, we're going to be meeting the children, the youth are going to be having a movie night, and then I'm going to be teaching through foundations. It's going to be in this room. It's a, it's a class that comes right after Roots. If you haven't had the class because it hasn't been offered here, but I'm going to be teaching it, and, and you're invited to be, be a part of that, six to eight on Wednesdays, and uh, there's a sign-up in the back. We'd like to get your name on that just so we can have a, a, an idea about how many people are going to be coming to that. Six o'clock, eight o'clock on Wednesday, I'll look, look forward to seeing you. And also, if you're a guest here today, we're just thrilled that you came. I'm going to be in the back. We have a gift for you, and we will just let you know. We, we're glad you're here. We'd love to have you come back. So if you have offering, there's a, there's, a, there's a plate in the back. You can drop that. And if you have some trash or pens that you want to deposit, there's, there's baskets in a, in a receptacle back there. You can put those things in there. Okay, let's stand together, shall we? And let's pray. Father, we come in awe that you would love us, in awe that you would want us, in awe that you would provide the way that we could be with you, that you would actually pay for our sins, and that you would suffer for us that eternity in hell on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. And as we go into this world that is desperate for you, Father, I pray that you'll help us to know that there are a whole lot of people that are just looking for someone to point them to the truth and point them to the hope in Jesus. So, Father, help us to see it. Help us to to catch it. Help us to commit to being your ambassadors, to being like Paul and going to be ready to speak. And Father, I pray this week that you give that opportunity to us and that you will use us for your good and your glory. As we leave this place, Father, and enter into the mission field like Paul, take us in your name and in your grace and in your authority. And we lift it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.